Hello, everyone. Good morning. The children can be dismissed to Children's Church if they have not already gone. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to be able to speak. Uh, grateful to John. And what I want to talk about today is uh, it's going to come from Joshua 24, and it's going to be verses 15 through 28. Joshua 24, 15 through 28. And <clears throat> this morning, I want to talk about the importance of choices. The importance of choices. And often, you know, we have choices all throughout our life. Our life is really filled with different types of choices. Some are more significant than others, you know, but our days are full of just little choices that we make all the way through. Um, for example, you can choose uh, how you spend your time. So, you know, do you sit there and scroll on Facebook for like an hour or Twitter, and that time's just kind of gone? Like that, you know, probably a poor way to spend your time uh, a little bit. That's what I do too often. Um, or you could sit down and read a book for an hour, which, you know, by the end of that, you might feel a little bit uh, smarter, you know, uplifted. Um, so how do we spend our time? We have a choice of uh, what we eat. So for your dinner, you could eat a salad and fruit and, you know, probably feel pretty good later. Or you could eat Taco Bell and maybe feel a little bit weird <laughs> after that. <laughs> we have choices. <laughs> uh, you know, what do we do? So... Um, choices are very important, and, you know, some are small, and some have more significance to them. And I thought about, you know, th important choices through history, and some stand out. And uh, one I thought about was in relation to Franz Ferdinand, that archduke, and he was uh, next in line for the empire of Austria-Hungary. And he had an interesting choice the day uh, where he was assassinated. So um, very, very interesting story. Like, if you've not read anything about that, there's a lot of weird details to this thing, but uh, I'm just going to touch on the very basics. So he is going, he's in this town, and he uh, is going to this meeting, and the assassin's group threw a bomb, and it's uh, poorly timed. So it hits the car behind him. They get injured. So he keeps going. He's survived. He goes to the meeting. He does his thing there, and, uh, and he, he finishes. And so his choice probably, you know, should have been just to go home and get protected. But he chooses instead to go to the hospital to, vid to visit those who had just been injured in that uh, bomb. So he's going to go to the hospital to see them. But him and his driver, they're not super familiar with this city. So as they're on their way there, they get kind of turned around and go down a wrong street and, you know, make all these wrong turns. And, uh, and they end up in traffic. Another part of this story is the assassins group, one of them, he says, you know, they failed. They didn't get who they wanted, so they're done for the day, and they're just going to go have lunch. So the, one of the guys goes to this deli, and he has lunch there. You know, he's not going to waste his time. He's just, you know, he's done for the day. He's going to relax. And so what happens, though, we know the Archduke is kind of lost, and he gets turned around, so he stops right in the middle of a street to kind of get his bearings and see where they're going. Just so happens that he stopped directly in front of that deli, that the assassin was eating his sandwich. And at the time he got his sandwich, he's walked out to the sidewalk, and the archduke stops there, like directly in front of him. He's like, well, this is a perfect opportunity. I'm going to take it. And he does. And that, you know, th those choices all correlated to make World War I. Like, so they all kind of, and many more choices were made. Um, but the weirdness and those choices that they made all were significant because of, you know, what it led to. Another choice that kind of is tied to this, um, Franz Ferdinand, is if you, Franz Ferdinand is the archduke that's next in line to be emperor for this thing called Austria-Hungary. And if you take that same empire and go back a little bit, it's just a renaming of the Holy Roman Empire. And if you go back a few emperors, you'll get to a man named Charles V. And Charles V is the one that Martin Luther stood before. And, and he's saying, you know, Martin Luther recant what you're saying because you're messing things up for us. The Holy Roman Empire is a Catholic empire. They're saying, stop it. And he says, here I stand. I can do no other, so help me God. So he stands before the, you know, the emperor, Charles V, and makes his stance there. He chose to do that. So same area of the world, two very uh, world-changing, significant choices that were made. 
Obviously, not all choices are going to be that big. They're not probably the choice you make for dinner is not going to change the world like some of these, but it does have an effect on the world around you. So some of the choices that you make will affect the immediate circumstances that you're in and then the things that are happening around you. You can have a say in how these things kind of play out. And choices are important because of that. Of course, the most important choice that we all have is what we do with Jesus. So we have, you know, we have the gospel, we have that truth, we understand it, what do we do with it? Do we accept it? And when we accept it, we have eternal security. We are going to heaven and we're safe. So that's all secured. But when you wake up every day, really there's a second choice that you're making, and it is to devote this day to God. So you could be saved, you made that choice, but you could choose wrongly every given day, and you wouldn't have a very productive Christian life. You wouldn't have this victorious Christian life. But if you wake up and choose that to follow after Christ with this day, you'll have that victorious Christian life. Those choices all count. But then if you choose the day to give it to Christ, then you have more choices that spring up. So you have a choice of how to go about doing that. You have a goal of serving Christ, but you have to put legs to that goal. And this choice on how to do that, it's all for you. It's all on you. You, you decide that. You can be creative in how you go about serving Christ. And so how that looks, how you serve God, is really tied to how the, what choices you're making and how you go about doing it. For example, uh, GCC had the goal of, of feeding the hungry. So how do we do that? That's a, it's a noble goal, but there has to be an action step. And someone here had the awesome idea of working with Lawrenceville Co-op. And they had the idea of hope for the hungry. And so that, that sprung from someone wanting to do it and saying, how do I do it? And they had the choice. They made the choice. Cooperate with these, uh, these places. So that choice was made. Um, so the choices we make are very important, and they can have an effect on the world around us. So Joshua is having uh, this time here, and he's giving them a choice. He's saying, choose today who you're going to serve. Make your choice, and, and then when you do make your choice, stick to it. Make it personal. Be confident, and be continual with it. Just keep going with that, that decision. So we see our support here in Joshua 24, 14 through 18, and then I'm going to jump down to 25 through 28. And it's kind of a lengthier portion of Scripture, but I think that is important to get in the Bible because, you know, when we're reading the Bible, the time we spend reading the Bible, you know that there's not going to be an error in that. It's inerrant. This is right. So the time I'm reading the Bible, I'm definitely not saying something wrong. The other times I could be saying something wrong, and you should be monitoring that, and and we could talk about it. I could misunderstand something, but here, we're not. We're correct. So Joshua 24, 14 through 18 says, Therefore... Fear the Lord and worship him in sincerity and truth. Get rid of the gods your fathers worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and worship the Lord. But if it doesn't please you to worship the Lord, choose for yourselves today which you will worship, the gods your fathers worshipped beyond the Euphrates River or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. As for me and my family, we will worship the Lord. The people replied, We will certainly not abandon the Lord to worship other gods. For the Lord our God brought us and our fathers out of the land of Egypt, out of the place of slavery, and performed these great signs before our eyes. He also protected us all along the way we went and among all the peoples whose lands we traveled through. The Lord drove out before us all the peoples, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will worship the Lord because he is our God. And then he kind of restates that. And then down in 25, On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people at Shechem, and established a statute and ordinance for them. Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. He also took a large stone and set it up there under the oak at the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, You see this stone, it will be a witness against us, for it has heard all the words the Lord said to us, and it will be a witness against you, so that you will not deny your God. Then Joshua sent the people away, each to his own inheritance. So Joshua is walking these, these Israelites through this covenant renewal. He's saying we're renewing our choice. We've made the choice. We've been the people of God, but we're going to renew that here today. And he's leading them in that. And he says there, though, he, he takes his stand. He says, I've made my choice, and I'm confident about that. I'm sticking to this now, and me and my family are here. Where are you all? 
Are you with us too? Are you going to serve God with your life? So we see here that he made his choice confidently. He's confident in the fact that God is the correct way to go. And he was able to make that confident decision because he knew things about God from the past of Israel. And he kind of goes through some of that. And he's learned lessons from the past with Abraham and with Jacob and Esau. And he saw how their lives went. And he learned lessons from them. And he kind of knew how God had performed in the past. And with Abraham specifically, he saw that God keeps his promises. So God kept his promise to Abraham that he was going to multiply his seed. But one thing about it is it doesn't happen very quickly. It happens in God's timing. So it's not in probably what Abraham would have preferred the timing be. So it takes from the promise to Isaac, it's about 20 years, which is kind of a long time to wait for the promise of God to come through. Um, and he does. And then when Isaac meets Rebekah, it takes a long time for them to have children too. So the grandchildren take a really long time to come, Jacob and Esau. So the promise was made, and it was kept, but it was in God's timing. And that's what Joshua learns here as he's looking back on the history and how he can be confident. He knows that God keeps his promises even though it's in God's timing and not quite maybe what Joshua would have preferred it be. And then as we kind of look at Jacob and Esau too, they are an interesting story as well. So Joshua looks back and he can choose confidently because he sees uh, their story and the fact that uh, God, there's a kind of a mystery to God in that uh, that sometimes the ones that he's using the most have to suffer. And we see that in Jacob and Esau. So Esau and Jacob, he's, uh, Jacob's kind of the chosen one. So he's going to be the one that the seed kind of goes through, and, and he's the chosen group of people. Esau is not. He's not the chosen one. But if you look at the results of their lives, you have Esau who gets his inheritance of his land really quickly. So he's done. He's got his land. He's living. He's happy. You look at Jacob's uh, trajectory, it's not quite the same. He doesn't get his land. He gets uh, into Egypt, and then his people go into slavery for a long time, and then they leave. So it's not, uh, it's, you know, it's a little bit different. He's the chosen line. So you would have think it'd be counter that, but it's not. And it's because that's a mystery of God that oftentimes the chosen ones of God will have to suffer. And we see that in Jesus. He's a man of suffering acquainted with grief. So he, he went through this as well, being the chosen one of God. So that's one of the mysteries of God. And, and Joshua can choose God confidently because he's seeing the whole picture. It'd be different if God had said, hey, you know, it's going to be great. It's no problems at all. It's going to be smooth sailing. And then as soon as he hits a problem, you know, like, why did Esau get his land? You know, what's going on? I'm out. Because he wouldn't have seen it coming. But God was up front with him. He said, this is what it's going to look like. So he was more confident in, in accepting that because he knew what it was going to look like. He learned that from the, the past of Israel. And so as we, you know, Joshua reflected on all of that, and he was educated in what his people believed. And he had thought out, you know, why he believed it. He didn't just accept it from Moses and say, I believe exactly what Moses said, and when Moses is gone, I have no clue what I'm talking about. He thought through for it on his own, and he was educated in why he believed those things. And so when you asked him, he could defend it. And that's why he could choose it confidently. The same could be said of us. You know, if we want to choose our belief confidently, we have to understand it for ourselves. So if we have a question about something that we don't think makes sense to us, I encourage you to investigate that. Because, you know, you investigate it, get into those things, that educate yourself on the things of faith. Make it, under, make it you know, understandable to your own mind so that you can explain it for yourself. Don't say, my mom understood it, or my dad understood it. Say, I understand it, and I can defend it. Because when you go through that, you know, there's, when you don't understand something, it's a little bit weird and scary, but you, once you figure it out, your faith really becomes stronger because you've come on the other side of that doubt, and now you have figured it out for yourself, and you decided if you still choose God, your faith is stronger then because you've, you've gotten stronger in your belief system, and you uh, in your confidence in what you're choosing. And if you need confidence as well to chase after God and choose him, just look at your own life and how God has taken care of you through, you know, every step of, of your life. Um, and a lot of good things happen. For example, you're alive. Like, that's a blessing. Every day we wake up is a blessing, right? We don't, it's not guaranteed. Um, so we get that blessing every day. 
And if we are not, you know, as sinners, the Bible explains to us that what we deserve is eternal judgment. Like that's, if, so every time that we're not instantly thrown into eternal judgment, uh, we have a blessing. Um, and then, you know, even when we do die, that's the worst thing that can happen to us as Christians. But really that unlocks the greatest thing for us because then we have eternal life and we have presence with God. So you can't really go wrong. We, we can choose God confidently because of what he's done for us in our life. So our choice to follow God, it should be confident, and then it should also be personal. It should be of our own mind and our own heart choosing God. Um, and make it real for ourselves. It should be both of those things, but should it also our choice should be confident, personal, and it should be continual. So as we go through our life, you know, choosing God continually is very, very important, being consistent with it. And when you think about it, the reason that we're here today is because someone in the past made a continual choice to choose God. They stuck with it. And over time, it progressed, and we've come to today. So we're all the result of someone from the past choosing to continually choose God. We're living those results today. Um, and so as you look at Joshua's life, he's experiencing the same thing. Israel is where it is at this point because of what had gone before him. And it's significant that they are in the city of Shechem because some important things that happened in Shechem. So Shechem was a place where Abraham met with God and he got the promise that his seed was going to be multiplied. So that was at Shechem. So some big things that happened there. Another big thing that happens there is Jacob. He's moving through there too later. And his camp has some idols with it. So he's going to purge those idols out. So he collects them all up and he buries them at Shechem. So they kind of rededicate themselves, their whole camp, to the Lord there. So there's a choice that's been made. Abraham made the choice to follow God. Jacob's made that choice. And so now Joshua is here at the same place, Shechem, and he's making a choice too. And he's older now, and he's renewing this covenant with the Israelites saying, you choose, and he's kind of stepping away. So that's all happening here at Shechem as well. So Israel is who they are because of the things that had happened in that location and in their, cult their country's history. And the same could be said of us. We're all here today we, because of past choices. GCC has its story of faith, of people that have gone before and made those decisions. And we've built off of that. So the, the way that we do things here, the, the decisions that we make, the way we proceed, it's all because of stuff that has gone before. And it's kind of obvious because Christianity didn't start in, you know, here. It started in the Middle East. So it took a consistent choosing for it to have even gotten here. So it was the Middle East, then it came to America. Someone chose to take it to America, and then someone chose to take it to Atlanta, Georgia. And then someone chose to take it to Gwinnett Community Church. And so it's been a consistent line of choices that have gotten us here. So the choices that people made back then shaped who we are today. And then another thing to think about is the choices that we make today are influencing the people in the future. So the GCC that exists three or five years from now is being shaped by the choices and the decisions that we make here today, like the, the ones that we are actually living. And it's kind of weird to think about, but it's also kind of encouraging because when you plug in, when you get involved, and when you help make those choices, you're helping to shape that church that exists later. Like how they did before us, they, they came together, they made those choices, and the trajectory was set to be here today. The choices that we make now, we're setting up the trajectory for that church five years from now, which is kind of interesting. But if you get plugged in, you're a part of that new church. You get to have a say, and you get to make the decisions. So one part of investing in that future church is also investing in the next generation of people. And I think GCC does a great job of this. So we do invest in that next generation, and we do a lot of that. And I try my best with the youth to invest in that next generation as well. Um, so we are working hard to do that. But it's important that we do keep doing that. So we have to keep on that road and, and invest in that next generation. And we see an example of how this didn't work in the Bible. So Joshua, uh, the people right after him, 
and the people that knew him, they all do great. So they do keep influencing the next generation. But there would, one, there would come one that didn't, and they actually do fall away. And we see that. So Joshua 24, 31 says this. This is the end of Joshua. It's kind of like a summation. Israel worshiped the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime and during the lifetimes of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had experienced all the works the Lord had done for Israel. But then, if you go to Judges chapter 2, verses 6 through 12, Judges 2, 6 through 12, we see an update of that. So it says, Previously, when Joshua had sent the people away, the Israelites had gone to take possession of the land, each to his own inheritance. The people worshipped the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime and during the lifetime of the elders who outlived Joshua. They had seen all of the Lord's great works he had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age 110. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance in timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gesh. Uh, that whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. The Israelites did what was evil in the, in the Lord's sight. They worshipped the Baals and abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed other gods uh, from the surrounding peoples and bowed down to them. They angered the Lord, for they abandoned him and worshipped the Baal and the Ashtaroths. So we see here an update of what happens to Joshua and the Israelites. They actually do go off the, tra- the track a little bit. And it gets so bad eventually that they lose the land. So Assyria comes and smacks them, and then Babylon comes in and takes them. So um, they, they get so far afield, and they're worshiping other gods, that it actually uh, they lose everything. And so how do we avoid that fate? How do we keep the next generations going after us? And so there is some things that we can do to help that. And one thing is that Joshua is saying, as for me and my house, so we want to be ministering to our children as the next generation and, and explain all of these things to them. And obviously there's a limit to that. Like you can't choose for them. Like you can't bend their free will. But you can do your best. Like you can help them see everything that will help them to choose God. And it might be that you could, you know, um, help them where you had trouble in your, in, when you were younger to understand things. Maybe you could explain it to them better and help them along this road. So that's something as for me and my house. But another aspect of this is not just your children, it is just the next generation in general. And you can be reaching them. And I think, you know, a a great way to do this is something we're doing now is the Pray For Me campaign. So there's that. We're investing in that next generation. It's an older generation looking to the next and saying, how can we pray for you? How can we help you? How can we, you know, help you to avoid the things that we ran into? So the things, you know, you might have had a hard time coming to God and you didn't understand it until maybe late in life. And some, maybe that's something that you can help this kid avoid, like help them understand it a little bit better so that they don't run into the same roadblocks that you did. And that's a blessing that you could give to them. So that's a Pray For Me campaign can help us do that. So I do encourage you to plug into that uh, as we're doing it. So it's important to be ministering to that next generation. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord, and then just all of the next generation. And, you know, an important part of that as well is to continue doing it even in the changing world, even when things are changing all around us. And there is, you know, as we look at the time of Joshua, there's a lot of changes happening in Joshua that we can kind of relate to today. So Joshua is, Moses has passed away, so that was a huge thing. Now Joshua is leaving the scene, so that's another huge thing. And then they're slowly kind of creeping towards this model of the judges, which is kind of chaos, but they are slowly inching towards that. Um, And that's the kind of changes that are happening here. So he's choosing to follow God, and he's choosing to minister to the next generation, even though all of these things are happening, even though it's a chaotic world. And we can learn from that because the last few years have been uh, a lot of change. It's been kind of chaotic too. Um, No one expected the pandemic and all these things that have come from all of that. So some changes have happened. A lot of things stayed the same, like some things just don't change, but some things have changed. So, for instance, um, live stream is a much more big thing than it was, and uh, internet church and different things like that. 
So changes are happening. The, some things stay the same, but other things do change. And, you know, a little bit of change at a time is fine. I think that we expect that. But I think what's happened is you've had a, a lot of change happen kind of all at once. And that's intimidating to think like everything's kind of changing. Um, but the change in itself is not really intimidating. It's something that has to happen. Like, in fact, you know, if, it's not, if nothing's changing, then we should probably worry then. Like, some things need to be changing. That, that's progress. That's progress. That's life. Change is life. Like, we have to keep changing. Um, we don't change the core doctrines, but we do change some of these peripheral things. And one, you know, opportunities that change brings is oftentimes you had some open doors of opportunity, and you were working on these, and what has happened with change, they've been shut. And so you can knock on it, but it's not opening. And what has happened, though, another door has been blown open over here. And what we have to do as a church is see where those are. Like, see, this one's been closed. This one's been opened, and we have to capitalize on that. And so those are the, that's how we kind of address the change. But the church will always adapt. It's going to find this new situation, and it's going to grow into it. And it always has. So we look in the, into history. Um, these things, you know, uh, in history, there's been some really big changes. And oftentimes, when a big change happens, um, we're taken by surprise. I don't think any church ever expected uh, the pandemic or all the results that happened from it. And often, you know, things do happen like that where it catches the church off guard. But it didn't catch God off guard. Like, he saw all this coming. Like, he knew what was going to happen. Um, and as we look throughout history, there's some things that have happened uh, huge in the church. And the church adapted, and it's, it came through stronger. So one is the Reformation. So we have the Reformation. That was a humongous change. And you've, like, you've lived in this town your whole life in the you know, 1500s. And you've always gone to this church. Your whole life is built around this church. Because in the Middle Ages, the church is like a much more central part of your life. Like more than it is today, it was everything, the church. And so you're going to this every, all, all the time. And what's happened with the Protestant Reformation is they come in and burn that church down and they put up a new Protestant one and you're required to go there. Like, so that's, that's different. Like that's a, that's a challenge. But the, the church survived that. They, they came through stronger, right? So that was a humongous change. Another change that I thought about is um, the change in America, the American church, when we changed from the horse and buggy to the car, which doesn't sound maybe like a huge thing, but when you think about it, that's a huge change. And it really only happened in the 1930s, which seems kind of recent to me. Like it, that was a huge shift in the 1930s uh, from where you live in your town in a horse and buggy, you know, you can go a few miles, but there's a lot of logistics that go to that. Like you have to feed the horse, clean the horse, do all this stuff. Um, and so you're only going a few miles away from your house pretty much a lot of times ever. Like you're not really going very far because there's, it's so difficult. With the invention of the car, your options of where to go increased exponentially. Like you could go, you know, <laughs> really, really far and it'd be much less hassle. So what happened to the church is that you used to go to this church your whole life and for generations back always went to that church because you couldn't really branch out very far. And what's happened with the car, you could leave that church and go somewhere else now. So the shift that happened is pretty crazy to think about. People started moving all over the place. And if you think about it today at this church, it, how many of us could get here if it was horse and buggy? It would have been a different deal altogether. The car made it possible for us to be here today. So, uh, you know, that, that shift is huge, and the church was fine. It, it adapted, and it, it made it through that, the, the change from horse and buggy to car. And, and it will continue to, ch to adapt. The church will never be defeated because Matthew 16, 18 says the gates of hell cannot stand against the church. Do we believe that? Like, will it be able to engage with the changes that happen throughout history? It's going to keep being able to engage with them because it will not be defeated. So as we look at the, you know, the choices that we have and, and moving forward in this church, some things do not change. But some things, you know, like the, the, the doctrines that we believe, Jesus and the Trinity and the inerrancy of the Word of God, like those things don't change, but these peripheral things do change. And we can think through how we want them to look. And we can make those decisions and, 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 and push forward with it. 
So I encourage you that, you know, as we're making these decisions, now is a time of change. So if we're, we're making choices, you can have an input on what the, the future church looks like. You can have a hand in it. You can make a choice and, and contribute towards all of this. So don't be passive in it and let just things happen to the church and you're just kind of there five years from now. But the opportunity is that you can, you know, be plugged in and you can have a hand in the game. You can have skin in the game. Um, I thought of an illustration of this, and um, I don't know if any, many of you know what's happening with Meta and Facebook. Um, it's kind of collapsing in a way. Like, it was really, he's like one of the richest men in the world, and now he's like, he was like number three, and now he's like number 20 because he invested in this Meta, and it's kind of a weird, interesting thing. But so the stocks are kind of <laughs> cascading on that on Facebook. Um, and so if you are like me and you're just sitting off to the side, you're like, boy, that's unfortunate. Like, <laughs> but if you have stock in Facebook and that's a significant portion of your money, then you're kind of worried. Like, you got skin in the game here. This is bad. Like, <laughs> it's all collapsing. Um, and so the ones that have skin in the game are more worried than the ones that are, you know, not really. And that's true of everything in life. The ones that are really into it you know, are concerned about how things kind of turn out. And with the church, you know, if you're not involved at all and, you know, things are well or things are bad, then you're like, you know, it's going to happen one way or the other. But if you're plugged in, like, you're really into the big highs and you're, you can help in the big lows, like, so you are plugged into that church and you can have, you know, you are invested in it and you have a, a, a say in it. So I encourage you to do that, you know. And so with the, when you think about getting plugged in, there are existing ministries here at the church already. And you can get plugged into those, and you can choose. And so if you're not already, if you are in it, that's great. But if you want to be plugged into one and, and help with that, you know, that church five years from now, where that, that ministry has your input and your energy, it's missing that right now because you're not in it yet. Like, it needs your mind and your energy to contribute towards the, the, the complete goal. So that ministry is pointing at a goal it's missing your input right now. So you can plug into that and be a part of how it moves forward. Um, and if there's a ministry here that you would like to see that's not here, then you can be a part of starting it because, you know, that, that church five years from now could have a thriving ministry that's doing exactly what you're thinking, but right now it's just in your head. <laughs> it's not here yet. And you could be starting it and you could be, you know, investing in it in five years from now. We have a thriving ministry here at GCC that is exactly what you wanted to see. So you can be a part of that. So I encourage you to plug in. Where, what, what does that church look like three years from now? Are you a part of it? Are you pushing towards that future? So as we look at this, as we're choosing God, you know, choose to say for yourself, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then after that, you have other choices to make. You choose him confidently, choose him personally, choose him continually, and keep going with it, and then make those other choices that are peripheral, that are up to you. Engage with them. Don't just let them sweep under the rug and, and look back five years from now and be like, boy, I wish I would have done something with that. Choose now, and you can be pointing at that. You know, uh, we miss all the shots we don't take, and the, the target, if we don't have a target, we miss it every time. Like, so there has to be something you're aiming at, so do like engage with it and aim with that and, and go towards it and help us as a church go in that direction and then invest in that next generation. Help them to come up maybe better than you did, understanding God a little bit more deeply than you did at their stage. So choose today. Choose today, God, and choose to be a part of what this church looks like five years from now. Be truly invested as for you and your house. Serve the Lord. So now that we are um, here, we're making a choice, um, and we're choosing to um, commemorate a choice that we made in the past, and it was to give our lives to Christ. And we're going to observe the Lord's Supper.